find everybody a little later <laughs> in case that wasn't loud enough um these are put up on youtube for everybody to rewatch in case they don't have time to come and join us tonight um <clears throat> If you don't want your face to be shown, um, we will be taking a little screenshot later. Um, or if you don't want your name to be in this video also, um, you can change both of those just by right clicking yourself and then hitting that rename button over there. And then you can call yourself a fish or something cool. Um, but welcome everybody to the Coast of Corals online edition. Um, it is already October this year. I've blinked and this entire year has gone by. Um, I hope everybody's been enjoying themselves since we last saw you last month. Let's get into it. I just wanna start by acknowledging the traditional owners um, of the land of which we're on. Um, I'm in the Sunshine Coast. So for me, that's the Cubby Cubby people. Um, and we wanna pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, and all the other tribes from which everyone else is calling in from, because there are 400 in Australia, I believe. And this is tonight's event, um, Seaweed Solutions, using seaweed to combat disease in fish and shellfish in aquaculture marine systems. So before we begin, um, we're just gonna go through a couple of things. Um, in case you don't know who all of these beautiful faces are, um, Reef Check Australia is a nonprofit organization um, that's actually an international, it's not just in Australia, it's throughout 90 countries all over the world. Um, and we believe in protecting our reefs and oceans by empowering just local ordinary people. You don't have to be a scientist. So we go out and engage the community in events like this to try and educate people on how they can reduce the everyday impact of their life, um, as well as going out and doing survey diving, like one of our divers on the right here. So we go out and monitor the health of the reefs over a long period of time. In Southeast Queensland, we've been doing this since the early 2000s um, and produce some long-term data reports, which then turn towards um, our policymakers um, and hopefully create marine parks. We have a success story of this just last year. Um, in the Gold Coast, we helped get a couple of the coral reefs off their um, coast protected, um, which was absolutely amazing to see. And we're trying to do the exact same thing here in the Sunshine Coast. So just um, a couple of housekeeping things in case you guys aren't familiar with Zoom. Um, if you could please keep your video and microphone muted this whole time. If you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat and either me or another ambassador. Um, we'll try and get that to Maddie. Um, if you're not on the mailing list and you want to be, it's just there, Southeast Queensland events at reefcheckaustralia.org. We send out a monthly e-newsletter, um, just letting everybody know the local community conservation action that's going on in your area. Um, and if you have any questions, like I said earlier, use a chat box and we will be getting a group photo, as I said, um, in just a moment as well. Um, just to see that everybody's not robots. We're not talking to black screens because it sometimes feels like that. So just a couple community events um, that are happening in the local area. Um, beer yoga is our monthly um, house of fun, really. It's hosted down a further south um, in Kalounja. Um, it's $35, it includes two beers, and it's an hour of sweaty, beer and yoga together. It sounds like a weird mixture, but it is lots and lots of fun. There's always so much energy. Um, we meet heaps and heaps of cool people. Um, and what's a better excuse to have some beer than for conservation? So you can either head to your mates, otherwise uh, Reef Check Australia's Facebook page also advertises this. Um, and I do recommend you book. You can't really show up um, because these events do sell out. They are very popular. And due to COVID, the numbers are a little smaller than normal. So if you're not doing anything this weekend, we have a million things for you guys to do. Um, the Surf Rider Sunshine Coast uh, Foundation are having a cleanup, two cleanup events up on Double Island Point this weekend. Um, so if you've got a full drive and you want to spend your day picking up trash on the beach, it sounds uh, a lot less fun than it actually is. 
uh, I can guarantee you it, it is actually kind of fun. Um, then head over to their Facebook page, Surf Rider Sunshine Coast, um, and sign up to that event. However, if for whatever reason you didn't want to go, oh, okay, uh, never mind, I'll, I'll come back to that. A Horizon Festival is another um, Sunshine Coast activity that's happening. It was meant to be um, <clears throat> starting in August, but it started a little late just due to COVID restrictions. Um, if you look up Horizon Festival on Google, um, it's a multicultural festival as well as a conservation um, type festival. So it merges um, a lot of cool different things. It's facilitated by Sunshine Coast Council. Um, there's already been a heap of uh, singular events happening. Um, it's all over the Sunshine Coast from the top to the bottom, Noosa to Caloundra. Um, and there's even a couple in Brisbane as well, if anybody's down there. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, just head on over to their website as well if you wanted more details on that. So on Saturday is the next um, beach cleanup. Um, and this one is down south in Caloundra in Happy Valley. It's from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And this sounds also like heaps of fun. Um, it is brought to you by Visionary Ocean Warriors. Um, if you guys haven't heard of them, they're a really small nonprofit organization. <clears throat> I met them a couple months ago. They're the sweetest little family um, that just wanted to go and do beach cleanups and they couldn't really find um, the right time or the right um, group because there are several of them. So they decided to make their own. Um, and this one is uh, also in conjunction with OSMAP, um, which is a microplastics group, um, and Tangaroa Blue. Um, but there's going to be heaps of different Enviro stalls. There's going to be some live music. There's also a waste workshop. Um, a cafe is coming. There's some recycled art. And there's also a secondhand pre-loved op shop, a pop-up op shop that's going to be there. And the cool rewarding thing with this beach cleanup is if you guys go and participate in this, um, then you can go and do some shopping for free. The op shop will donate an entire bag full of clothes for you to pick out um, for your hard work of picking up trash and cleaning up our beautiful beaches. Um, it's from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. in Clark Place Park. Um, and you can either sign up on Eventbrite. It's also got a Facebook event as well. If you just look up the big beach cleanup. And if you aren't going to either of those two cleanups, then there's a third one as well with me um, um, and a professor in marine science, actually. Um, this is a much smaller group. Um, it's a bunch of researchers that have just launched this project called Global Ocean Beaches. Um, and we're actually trying to make the world's first map of plastic distribution. Um, so if you come out with us, we'll walk along the beach with your GPS and every time we pick up a piece of trash we'll hit a little button and we'll do that a million times um, and then the next day after some vino and a nice rest um, we'll produce some maps along the beach to see exactly where the plastic is distributed along the coast and we're going to correlate that to weather conditions um, and try and find out if there's a pattern on where the plastic is ending up on the beach and when it is ending up on the beach. So hopefully after some time and a lot of research, um, we can begin to improve the efficiency of all of these beach cleanups. Um, and we'll be able to know a little more about where plastic is along our coast. Um, so that's the idea of it. Currently, October is our community engagement month. Um, so both Friday and Saturday for the next three weeks, we have, um, we're going out to go clean the beaches. Um, all of this is on Meetup. So if you hop up on Meetup, it's a website um, where you can go to local events and just look up Global Ocean Beaches, that's where we are. Um, and I will also be launching an Instagram officially over the next few weeks as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that name, Global Ocean Beaches because you'll see my pretty, pretty face there. And then next month, we have an amazing speaker, one of my lecturers actually at the University of the Sunshine Coast, Dr. Vicky Schaefer. Um, 
which is going to be an absolutely awesome talk. It's on engaging tourists as citizen scientists in marine tourism. Um, Vicky Schaefer is an absolute idol of mine because I'm currently completing a double degree at USC, um, the University of the Sunshine Coast in animal ecology and business. And every time I tell people that, people are like, oh my God, business and science, that so doesn't work. Um, and that's exactly what Vicky Schaefer does. She did her undergraduate degree in science and she now is a senior lecturer in tourism, leisure and events management. Um, and she does an, a lot of research on how tourists interact with the local environment, such as going out whale watching with Sunreef, a local dive company, um, and how we can use tourism as a conservation tool, which is absolutely insanely cool. Um, so please, if you are free next Tuesday, November the 9th, um, head on over to Reef Trek Australia and sign up for this one. The registration will be opening next week. And this is our last talk for the year as well, actually. Um, we're going to give you guys a break of all this awesomeness over summer so you can relax and head to the beach yourself and enjoy all the beautiful things that are there. If you wanted to get involved um, and be a Reef Check ambassador like I and a few others um, on this call are, then you are more than welcome to. Um, there are two roles you can become in Reef Check Australia. You can either be an ambassador, um, which only takes a couple of days of training. We teach you all about coral reefs, about the ocean, but also about how to engage the community and have um, conversations, facilitate conversations with um, strangers about how they can try and reduce the impact on um, the local environment. Or if you are also a scuba diver um, and you have a rescue dive cert and over 25 dives, you're also eligible to become a survey diver, which is absolutely incredible. I've been trying to do this for the last two years because it's free diving and you get a safe coral reefs. So I'm not sure what else you would want to be spending your free time in. Um, it's loads of fun. You do have to do a little bit. Um, it's an Australian scientific accredited course. Um, so it is a little bit hard to complete, but Reef Chick Australia helps you through every step of the way. Um, it is actually a reduced price if you do it through Reef Check compared to doing it outside of the organization as well. Um, so if you're a scuba diver and you want to get involved in monitoring reefs, um, you can also do that as well. As always, if you guys aren't following us on socials, which I'm sure you guys all are because everybody here is amazing. Um, please do like us on Facebook and Instagram. We're most active on those two. Um, Facebook is where we share all of our events. Um, and we do have a calendar on Reef Check's website as well if you wanted to disconnect from social media. Um, a big thank you to all of the external organizations that sponsor this series as well. Um, nonprofit organizations are extremely hard to run simply because we can't make money for profit. Um, and these events like tonight aren't possible without the help of a, a, a village. It really does take a village. Um, so a big thank you to Sunshine Coast Council, the Clean Water Group, the City of Gold Coast, the Port of Brisbane, um, Mask Events, which is a local Sunshine Coast group, um, and the Townsville Council as well. And one more thank you, I believe, um, to, oh my God, Dave, <laughs> it does take a village. <laughs> um, one more thank you to all the volunteers at Reef Check. Um, this is an updated photo. Erland's not here, but thank you, Lindsay, Erland, um, Julie, Jody, everybody that volunteers is why these events happen and why everybody can enjoy their Tuesday night a little bit more compared to watching Netflix instead. And here's tonight's speaker, um, Madison Brown. So Maddie began her career over at Berkeley um, at California, where she completed a Bachelor of Science specializing in marine and freshwater ecology. Um, She's originally from Melbourne and she's now doing an honors project 
at USC as well on sustainable aquaculture. Um, she branched from marine science to aquaculture because the industry has direct consequences for human and environmental health, um, whilst being a multi-billion dollar industry, um, which makes it economically important. Without speaking too much about her, I'll let her do the rest of the talking. Welcome, Maddie. Hi, Pablo. Thank you so much for your introduction and hello to everyone else this evening. I'm Maddie, so it's great to be here with you today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you all. Here we are. Okay, beautiful. Can we see this, Pablo? Yep, that's perfect. Thank beautiful. you. Beautiful. All right, let's get cracking. So, uh, yes, as Pablo mentioned, I am conducting my honours research project at the University of Sunshine Coast. And today I'm going to showcase a little bit of that research, but I'm mainly going to talk a lot about just a lot of the different research projects conducted by the Seaweed Research Group, which are affiliated with the University of Sunshine Coast. So br more broadly, my presentation will be on just how um, using seaweed mechanism to combat disease in fish and shellfish aquaculture systems. So building this literature surrounding seaweed and where can we apply seaweed? Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to the beautiful seaweed research group, uh, talk about some of uh, individual research projects than mine, and then I'll go on to the process of my research. So the Seaweed Research Group is a group of researchers, might be uh, honours level or um, SRP students, which are undergrad researchers, all the way to postdoc, um, PhD students, it's a big group of us um, and the Seaweed Research Group aims to improve environmental, economic and social outcomes through the production of world-class seaweed research and development and the group are leading experts in the field and help communities, governments and businesses recognise opportunities to develop and cultivate seaweed as a resource that is good for the economy, it's good for the environment and communities everywhere. So the team is made up of more than 20 researchers and in this photo we are gathered here on a boat just before we went um, free diving at Moreton Bay. And so this is just a small portion of the group and you know the group consists of academic students and technical staff and there's you know the group there's a wide range of disciplines within the group so there's a diverse there's diverse perspectives within the group um, so some of them some of the disciplines involve marine science some involve aquaculture molecular biology ecology business, health and biomedical science, social science, um, yeah, and the list goes on. So the particular research focus areas usually involve seaweed, which is a high yield crop with productivity levels as high dense terrestrial vegetation. So it is, so seaweed is one of the largest aquaculture crops in the world with more than 25 million tonnes of seaweed produced per year, which is steadily increasing, um, which is really exciting for the aquaculture industry, which is continually trying, trying to diversify away from these monocultures. I think we've lost Maddie. Is it just me or is she frozen? No, she's frozen for me as well. Okay, well, 
while, while we wait for Maddie to unfreeze, I'm not sure what's to happen. Maybe she's lost her internet connection. Um, I forgot to do the polls and the photo, um, which is a great time to do it. Um, so if you guys just want to fill out where you guys are dialing in from, um, and if you're calling in from internationally, do let us know in the little chat and then where you heard about this talk as well. Yeah, she has lost. She'll just be reconnecting and probably freaking out. Sorry about this. Welcome back, Maddie. Holy moly, we are here. Uh, Huh. Don't worry, I'm doing um, a poll about where everybody is. So, and where, where have I been? I'm not, I'm not too sure. You froze um, about a minute ago, I think. Oh, lordy, lordy me. Well, um, should I, where should I, do you remember the exact place where I dropped out? You were. No, I don't. Sorry, I <laughs> you were in the middle. Was just saying how many, how much seaweed was produced every single year, and then about how um, that's steadily increasing, which is exciting. Yes. Yeah. Oh my god! Thank you. <laughs> that's so nice. Um, okay. Well, let's. Well, Pablo, do you want me to take the stage again? Please. Okay. All right. I'll take this poll away, and actually, that. Um, I think that was good because now it's refreshed my presentation, which is now fully loaded, which anyway, right, share. Okay, take two. Okay, so yes, I was here, I believe. Does that look familiar? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I pretty much was saying that's a very high yield crop. And we're um, really excited about investing in seaweed aquaculture because as you may know, aquaculture tends to have, I guess, negative connotations to it, um, especially land-based aquaculture. So we want to diversify aquaculture just like you could compare to agriculture. So, you know, agriculture have, has usually monoculture systems, which is like just one crop or just one type of um, animal, may it be cattle, for example. And if you diversify that crop, then essentially you, inc you increase the genetic diversity and, and it improves the system if there were ever, ever some sort of um, pathogen that could really reduce the genetic diversity or, and it makes them more resistant to disease. So that's why we want to include seaweed. We want to grow more seaweed here in Australia per se. So why do we study seaweed? Um, I'm gonna just show this little snippet from the seaweed research group. And you might get a little bit of insight about why we're so interested in seaweed. Seaweeds are really important. They create forests underwater that, just like forests on the land, create a habitat and food for a huge range of different animals and other plants as well. So when we lose seaweed forests, everybody loses, and that's because seaweed forests are the basis of coastal marine ecosystems. So they provide habitat, they're foundational species, and they support and underpin marine ecosystems along the coastline in Australia, here on the Sunshine Coast, and everywhere else in the world as well. People are really, really interested in what seaweed can do for them, for their health, what seaweed can do for the environment, and also what it can do for jobs. And it's a, a great thing that we can bring that type of knowledge and bring the research that we're doing at the university out into society. The Seaweed Research Group brings together a broad range of disciplines, people working in sciences, ecology, marine science, and biotechnology, as well as 
nutrition and dietetics researchers and business and consumer researchers. The shared vision of the Seaweed Research Group is to work with business, communities and government across the world to bring about innovations that have benefits for not only the economy but also the environment and our societies. And one of the things the USC Seaweed Research Group is really keen on doing here on the Sunshine Coast is setting up some large-scale seaweed restoration projects. This is a really great opportunity for Sunshine Coast uh, locals and people visiting the region to get involved in, and help us out as citizen scientists and it's something that's really positive to do. There are lots of health benefits to adding seaweed to your diet. Seaweeds are really versatile and they have a lot of different textures that they can include that make the foods healthier and more interesting, as well as they have a diverse nutrient profile. So there are essential amino acids, fibre, antioxidants, as well as minerals involved in seaweeds. The first step is to make seaweed more accessible to Australians. And I think we need to support local seaweed industries in order to do that. It could be incorporated into the staples. So if we added seaweed into flour, for example, then we could use that in pastas, um, breads, pizza bases, all those sorts of things that Australians already like to consume. So as well as the, the nutrient benefits and the health benefits to eating seaweed, there's also strong livelihood, livelihood impacts and social impacts of developing seaweed industries as well. There's a huge amount of potential and we're looking at it from all different angles and the exciting part is that when we start to talk about creating this new industry in something of a big scale, it can lead to tens of thousands of jobs, often in regional Australia, where we need to find employment and bring about a whole range of environmental benefits that can have local impacts as well as lead the way for our global climate change solutions. Beautiful. <laughs> so I feel like that little snippet really sums it up. We are just really passionate about involving, um, you know, the community, industries all together to collaborate and learn about seaweed and where can we apply seaweed it seems like a very um I guess like a, a foreign a foreign concept to us sometimes we go for a surf and it gets stuck in your leg or something like that or you might get tangled in some seaweed when you go on snorkeling and maybe it's a bit you know gross and smelly, but in fact, seaweed has so many applications and provides a really exciting opportunity to diversify aquaculture. So seaweed already is used due to its vast, this array of chemical compounds, which include essential oils, fatty acids, fiber, minerals, and antioxidants, and is often used in pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals. So, I particularly learned about the exciting research um, about seaweed through a documentary that was showcased on ABC iView called Fight for Planet A. So here um, in this documentary that was on ABC, my professor, uh, Nicholas Paul, who is also my supervisor, was uh, interviewed and essentially talks about this particularly particular red seaweed called Asparagopsis taxiformis, bit of a mouthful to pronounce. And this seaweed is really exciting because potentially can help fight climate change as it can reduce the methane production of ruminant livestock. And when I learned this, I knew that I had to get involved. So I would like to show you a few minutes of this documentary if, if that is okay. So I'm going to um, share a different screen with you now and then hopefully show it there. Okay, <laughs> I think um, that says enough. Let me share back to my presentation. So before I continue, can I ask whether anyone has any questions on what we just watched? Anything that needs to be cleared up? No? <laughs> so essentially Nick is showcasing some really exciting new research that has found that there's a chemical compound in this asparagopsis seaweed that can knock out 
the um, methanogenic bacteria in the rumen of a cattle, cattle's stomach, um, which can suppress the methane production, which is really exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, I, essentially what prompted uh, other researchers in the seaweed research group is other to find out whether asparagopsis can be applied to other industries other than you know, cattle, for example, like where else, if we were to produce asparagopsis on a large scale, where else could it be applied? If it does have these, you know, really exciting properties, surely we could apply it elsewhere. So we found ruminant livestock to be one um, area, where else could we, um, where else could we apply it? So this is just um, a tiny bit of the research that supports the anti-methogenic properties um, of asparagopsis. Um, so it has been found to reduce, um, uh, I think I spelled that wrong, eccentric methane production by 99% in vitro, which is um, in real life cattle, uh, beef cattle situations. And it is also found to um, significantly reduce uh, methane production of cattle in the in a rumen fluid uh, kind of simulation, which is really exciting because, um, as I as I have on the top right hand corner, is ten percent of greenhouse gas emissions in Australia are produced by ruminant fermentation, which is a huge percentage, um, and unfortunately these this percentages um, made a lot of made up of feedlot systems, which we know are um, really bad for the environment in terms of their methane production, particularly. So, um, can, as, aside from the use of asparagopsis as a supplemental feed for ruminant livestock, history of research has found that you know, these halogenic metabolites are biologically active, which are antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, and anti-inflammatory. So from the work from, nine, from the 1970s through to now, 2021, includes a range of study organisms. So um, used to evaluate where we can apply asparagopsis and its extracts, which include Human, humans, ruminants, livestock, fin fish, and marine invertebrates. And these investigations highlight diverse pathways which the seaweed is administered to obtain proposed benefits provided um, by the multiple chemical compounds stored um, or produced by asparagopsis. So asparagopsis also has these um, gland cells, which are just like most plants that actually um, release chemical compounds as a defensive mechanism. So um, seaweed releases chemicals into the water, um, like toxins, which prevent herbivorous animals from eating the seaweed, so prevent predators. So not only does the sea seaweed um, store these chemical compounds, but they also release it as well. So that's also interesting. Um, and we want to know whether we can apply asparagopsis as a whole seaweed, like we saw in those tanks, or whether it be in a dried format, um, which could then be supplemented into feed, you know, just like the pellets that are fed to cattle, for example, or um, the fish pellets that are fed to fish in in aquaculture systems. So considering the multitude of benefits of asparagopsis as an ingredient for fish and ruminant livestock, it is timely to explore whether asparagopsis can also function as a beneficial feed additive for other animals um, using other forms of agriculture, you know, it might be chicken or pigs, um, in aquaculture, it might be shellfish, such as oysters and mussels. Um, and this is really exciting because 
these anti antimicrobial effects of asparagopsis could be relevant to, you know, common bacterial and protozoan diseases that, um, as we may already know, really wipe out these aquaculture systems. Disease is um, number one, the biggest threat to um, farming fish. Uh, for example, salmon are highly prone to parasitic diseases on their skin, which is really awful. And then we have like a herpes um, HIV virus, which wipes out oyster farms. And this is really concerning as we really need to keep up with the growing demand of food. Um, but also we want to do this in a way that is sustainable. Um, a really exciting project conducted by Valentin Tepu, uh, but part of the seaweed research group found a different, um, well, application for asparagopsis, which was used as a feed supplement for farmed fin fish, particularly um, rabbit fish, which is um, a herbivorous, well, it's actually an omnivorous fish. However, this particular fish um, mainly eats seaweed more than it does um, eat meat. So that means that it can pretty much live off just eating seaweed. Um, and this is really promising as we could grow seaweed together with fish, which could co-mutually benefit each other. So I'm just going to show this video um, because I think Val sums it up really well. My work is looking at using seaweed as functional ingredient for fish. And I'm using the rabbit fish as model species for that work. The idea is to uh, actually be able to not use antibiotics by boosting the immune system of fish. So we don't require treatment down the track. From a trial we conducted uh, mid last year, we had uh, double the immune response in the fish that were treated with the seaweed compared to the fish that were not treated with seaweed. From that first in trial, we had three uh, best performers seaweed, Ulva, uh, Laurentia, and Victoria. One of them, Ulva, that we're cultivating here at the Barbie Island Research Center, uh, actually led to doubling in some uh, immune parameters in their activity. So that potentially translates into more resistance to disease and pathogens in aquaculture. This research is really uh, fundamental for agriculture across the globe because disease has been highlighted as the major limiting factor uh, for the industry and costing it up to $6 billion a year. So yes, I'm very, uh, very excited about my little uh, project of being able to have such an impact in actually in the agriculture industry worldwide. So yeah, Val is very modest to say that um, his project is little um, because in fact, he's had some really exciting um, findings. So you mentioned the innate immune system. So essentially there are various parameters that we can record in fish or even um, any animal, for example, that can um, allude to the immune health. Um, and this could be, for example, um, blood cell count and that can indicate how well um, a fish or well, an animal could respond to a pathogen whether it be bacterial or viral um, and and essentially uh, fight these um, pathogens you know whether we were waterborne um, or, or you know passed down um, in these kind of feedlot systems and this is really promising as you know as I said we have a growing demand for food in um, you know today's day and we really want to do that in a sustainable way um, and we don't really want to be we want to avoid using antibiotics and synthetic um, immune boosting supplements and even growth boosting supplements, we would prefer to use natural um, supplements, which could include 
seaweed. Um, follow this space essentially. And so I know there's a little bit of information on here, but I can quickly run over it. Um, that uh, Val found that when he fed um, salmon, Atlantic salmon, which is on the left, when he fed um, the salmon asparagopsis into their diet, it actually enhanced their growth rate, their feed intake, um, and also their immune response. And this is really exciting because it means that they're, got, they're more um, likely to fight diseases and they'll just be generally um, more healthy individuals. The seaweed supplement um, modified actually their gut um, intestinal um, microbial composition um, and also the genes related to immune, um, their immune system. He also used different seaweed dietary supplements, which is on the right hand side. Um, he did mention this in the video that I just showed. So he used different types of seaweed and you could see like some red seaweed and some green seaweed, uh, which was uh, most likely ulva, which is the sea lettuce. And he found that from all the different seaweeds he included, asparagopsis um, recorded the largest increase in hemolytic activity. Um, and hemolytic activity is, um, well, essentially immune cells in the fish blood, which help fight disease, which is really exciting. So he compared this to synthetic immune supplements. So he fed fish just with immune supplements with the synthetic ones and the antibiotics, and then he fed, fed them with the seaweed. And in fact, he found that the fish had more promising results in terms of their immune system in the seaweed fed um, samples. Very exciting. However, we have also found some deleterious effects of this asparagopsis. And sorry, I didn't I I telecise asparagopsis, which is very bad of me as a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> so can I ask what does the word deleterious if I even pronounce that oh, right, mean? That's okay. Um it means negative effects. Yeah, that's I didn't very know that. wow. Deleterious. Did I even pronounce did I even spell that right? Deleterious. Um so when asparagopsis is found in places that it is not native to. So when it is invasive or, um, yeah, non, um, what am I, what's the word? Essentially when it's not um, found in a, in a certain area, it can be, it can pose um, deleterious effects um, to the surrounding ecosystem. So studies have found that asparagopsis has deterred feeding from amphipods, um, which are little crustaceans and abalone. It has also caused immune stress to marine mussels um, in a study that actually recorded the, essentially uh, recorded um, the immune stress on mussels when subjected to the seaweed in a controlled setting. And it is also found that exposure to its exudate, which is kind of like what I spoke about before, which is those chemical compounds that they release into the water as a defense mechanism can actually cause um, physiological status impairment in exposed prawns and marine gastropods as well as feeding inhibition. So that pretty much means that asparagopsis um, can, can also cause, um, I guess, stress levels um, in, certain, um, in certain invertebrates. So we found that it's had good 
impacts in fish, which are vertebrates, but however, we've found deleterious effects in invertebrates, which are uh, our amphipods, you know, abalone, mussels, prawns, gastropods, etc. Um, so kind of now transitioning into my research. So when I first met up with um, my supervisors, we were talking about asparagopsis and we're talking about where it has been applied to in research and where it hasn't been applied to yet. You know, we've tested all these animals so far, but, you know, where, are the, where is there a blank space that, you know, I could just dive into? And we did mention that oysters are invertebrates, which means that they're very suitable for um, an honours research project because an honours year only goes for one year, which means that, um, you know, you it's a very short research project. Therefore, to get the ethics approval of working with vertebrates, um, it's a lot more difficult because you have to go through a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of ethic approvals. So oysters, considering they have a decentralized nervous system, it means that they are a suitable target organism. And other than the, you know, the viability for a research project, oysters also, um, the oyster aquaculture industry is a multi-million dollar industry in Australia comprising 23% um, of overall aquaculture production and valued at $220 million. However, disease is one of the biggest threats um, to the industry, which affects the quality of the crop, which is like the meat and the productivity, which is how fast they grow of, um, and in the farming operations. So the Sydney rock oyster, um, is the key species grown um, by the oyster industry on the east coast of Aus Australia. Um, and this is a picture on the right of the oyster lease, oyster lease farm in Moreton Bay, which is very close to us here um, on the Sunshine Coast. So essentially since the 1970s, this industry, which is the oyster industry, has been impacted by two major protozoan diseases. So we have winter mortality disease, um, which relates to the environmental conditions, and QX disease, which is a viral disease. And these um, diseases cause um, huge mortality rates um, and can kill up to 80% of oysters in a local area and the QX infection can kill up to 84% and in both cases um, prevention and control methods are very limited um, and are very difficult to come by. Therefore we want to future-proof these systems by keep um, by researching innovative ways to prevent disease outbreaks, outbreaks and find alternative ways um, to enhance the immune system of the oysters to prevent them from getting sick. Amazing. So this diagram shows a potential for a co-culture system in an open ocean aquaculture um, system. So here we have um, on the very bottom, we have some seaweed and the seaweed um, releases its chemical compounds into the water and also provide um, nutrients and are uh, photosynthetic. So they release oxygen into the water, which is helpful for, for um, our co-cultured organism, which could be fish, mussels, or um, crustaceans. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, so 
this is a little example of how maybe diversifying these um, aquaculture systems, how we could grow them all together to mutually benefit each other and future proof them from disease. And, you know, it does talk a little bit about nutrient cycling too, but I will not um, go too far into that. Beautiful. So uh, as we saw in Val's um, little interview video, um, rabbit fish and seaweed could be grown together. And we want to know whether asparagopsis could be grown um, with you know, oysters, for example. We want to test the viability of this co-culture in a marine ecosystem um, in an open ocean water system. So this video, I'll just turn up the volume, we can see there's different types of seaweed. We have the asparagopsis, which is the red, and ulva, which is the green, and the rabbit fish. And here they are um, they're providing co-mutually beneficial um, properties to each other. So we want to see whether this could be applied to the oyster industry as well as it has been for fish. My honours, so based on the work to date for asparagopsis in fish, there may be an opportunity to incorporate it into the diet of oysters and boost the immune system using feed supplements, but obviously natural feed supplements. However, because most of the oyster production cycle is in open ocean systems, which is um, what I showed the lease at Moreton Bay, that big blue lease, there also needs to be consideration of how to integrate this seaweed into that system. And the release of these uh, natural products of the seaweed into the water through co-culture, how could, how could that be viable? Could you grow it together? Could you administer it during, as a feed supplement during the hatchery and the rearing stages? Where could asparagopsis be applied? So that leads me on to my thesis, which is on the potential use of asparagopsis as an immunostimulant for oyster aquaculture. Lots of big words in that title, which is, makes it difficult to read every time. <laughs> and okay, what was really fun about our, well, my research, I should say, was there was a lot of field work involved to collect the oysters, we were snorkeling and free diving at Morton Bay, which is the rock oyster farm um, on Morton Island. And to collect the asparagopsis, which is that pink seaweed, we went free diving at Moffat Beach in the Sunshine Coast. We then process the seaweed, we rinsed it, and then we transfer it into the lab. So on the left, we have the, um, the, the Sydney rock oysters kept in aquaculture tanks at USC, and then they will be eventually transferred into these uh, individual jars, which is, where, which is how I will be um, conducting my experiments. The asparagopsis is transferred um, to the lab cultures um, before I use any experiments. So for my first experiment, I wanted to test the viability of a co-culture. So co-culture co essentially means um, grown together, like co is in co-culture. So in this little diagram that we've seen before, co-culture of seaweeds um, with various organisms has been suggested to deliver positive effects on water quality, um, which in turn benefit the co-cultured organism. However, um, a recent study has demonstrated that through the 
oxidation of the secondary metabolites, which are those chemical compounds released into the water, as baragopsis can have negative effects. In fact, this red macroalga has been found to pose toxic effects. Um, and this is a concern because we're not sure whether co-culturing seaweed, the seaweed with oysters could be beneficial or negative, I'm not sure yet. And so in the lab, like in this little picture here, I have a jar with some oysters inside and then the red stuff is the asparagopsis and they grow together for a certain controlled amount of time. Um, and I, I continually exchange the water and feed them as well with the standard oyster feed, um, which is um, like essentially phytoplankton. Um, and then over time, over two weeks, I test um, the survivability, which is whether they you know, live or die, or, <laughs> or I also test the immune response. Leading me on to my second experiment, which is using asparagopsis as a feed additive. So on the left, I'm using a pipette, um, which has the oyster feed, which is that phytoplankton mixture. But then I've also supplemented that with um, various dosages of asparagopsis. And that has either been um, substituted as um, a fresh additive, which is just literally um, blended seaweed, um, a whole dried seaweed, which is like a powder form. And I've also um, used it as an extract, which is where I use methanol and use exhaustive extraction to um, essentially you're left with a very small portion of the of the seaweed and you remove all of the fibrous um all the fibrous stuff the cellular stuff and then after two weeks similarly i will test the immune response based on various parameters so to test oh, one moment we're glitching out here Ooh. Oh, she's going. <laughs> okay. To collect my data, I extracted the hemolymph, which is the oyster blood. And I extracted that from the adductor muscle, um, which is the muscle responsible for the opening and closing of the oyster shell. And to do this, there's two ways you can do it. You can actually anesthetize the oyster. So you like put it to sleep and it opens up and then you insert a syringe, um, you insert a needle and then pull out the blood very, very slowly. Otherwise you can use um, pliers, which are like bone cutters and you clip the shell um, and then you poke a syringe through the adductor muscle. So I will just play this again. So yeah, that's pliers. And then I stick a syringe and suck out all of the blood. Yes. Okay. And then I process these blood samples under the fluorescent microscope. I use a fixative and then a DAPI stain and analyze it under um, the light microscope here. So you use a little pipette, put it under a slide, and then you look at under the light microscope. And then we count the number of hemocytes. So I get um, these, this is what it looks like under the light microscope. Those kind of green blue dots are the hemocyte cells. And the hemocytes indicate whether um, it indicate immune stress or immune health. So I would allude, I would that allude to a boost in re immune response for this top picture because there are more hemocytes. Whereas down here, 
we have less hemocytes. Um, and this is quantified using um, statistical data and also image J software, because obviously that would be awfully difficult to count um, just by eyesight. Um, so I just wanted to put um, some very basic uh, graphs of my results. So after two weeks of the experiment, so that was the co-culture experiment, I found that the filter water treatment, so the treatments that um, where the Sparagopsis was grown with the oyster, we I actually, well, oysters experienced 60% mortality, um, whereas the water treatments where I actually changed the water regularly, the mortality was 20%, which alludes to the fact that um, oysters are struggling to survive when um, grown with asparagopsis. For my experiment two, I also found that there was a 59% decline in hemocyte counts. And I don't think that I've made this graph large enough, but essentially on the X axis, I have asparagopsis stocking density, which is the grams per liter. Um, so the grams of seaweed per liter of water. And, and as you can, on the uh, X axis, we have an increase in asparagopsis, but as you can see that our hemocytes were really high for no asparagopsis co-culture, but as we added more and more asparagopsis, hemocytes dramatically declined. So this is a huge indication of immune stress, which means that the um, oysters are really struggling to survive under these conditions. Um, so invertebrates uh, often indicate a common regulation mechanism, which is uh, inflammation and uh, immunity responses in the presence of asparagopsis. And it's due to these secondary metabolites, um, which are natural products of asparagopsis um, that are released into the water to prevent, um, prevent um, getting eaten by herb herbivorous species and, and other consumers. And uh, in fact, a study recorded that the sublethal concentrations of asparagopsis exudate, which is the chemical compounds on the marine snail, um, were, yeah, were sublethal and essentially they couldn't survive under these conditions. And I won't go into this um, diagram here. So in conclusion, um, you could say that it is a little bit contradictory with, um, with just the vast array of research conducted about asparagopsis. We found really, really positive impact Packs, but we've also found some negative ones as well. And what, whether it uh, deleterious or beneficial, it is still um, adds to the growing literature about the various applications of the seaweed. Um, and continually researchers are learning more and more about the seaweed. The more we learn about it, um, it can assist us to make well-informed decisions regarding where we can grow asparagopsis. We definitely can't grow it with oysters um, on a large scale and where else we can apply it in the future. Um, so my references are just on this last slide and I will conclude my talk here. I would love to answer any questions if, um, if anyone has any questions for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that talk, Maddie. Normally I have a gazillion questions, but that was extremely informative. Every time one popped up in my head, you literally explained it straight after. Um, <laughs> so what was the biggest challenge you found so far in doing your honours project? Mm, biggest challenge. And while you're thinking of that, um, 
for the remaining participants, before I forget, would everybody like to turn on their cameras and we can do a quick selfie as well. And yes, I think hemolymph was definitely spelt wrong because um, I have to admit that it's spelt differently um, in, in different, yeah, but in different studies because hemocyte is sometimes, sometimes spelt with H-A-E and then also H-E-M. So I'm sorry about that. Um, That's all right. Yes, thank you for noticing that. It's good that somebody was paying attention, at least. That's all I thought about it. <laughs> at least someone knows how to spell. Awesome. Well, we have oh, what was the most challenging thing? Mm -hmm. um, I think was something that was surprisingly challenging was um, trying to remove like the bias involved in science. So, I mean, I started my presentation showing you all really exciting research about asparagopsis and then I end up finding that, um, in fact, it is uh, really putting oysters under huge immune stress. And I think that when you're looking, in, you know, through your data and you're, and you're going in through, through all of the, um, the data points you've made, you um, you can't yeah you can't lie with the research that you that you find. Um, no, and, there's yeah. also a comment from Irene that, uh, as well. That's been difficult. I think also like time is a huge factor because one year um, to find conclusives is is really hard. Mm. Um, yeah, one year is just not enough time. Mm. And I would like to continue my studies, but I only have one year of my honours. Guess you've got to do a PhD then. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Awesome. So for the people who do have their cameras on, thank you. Um, I'll just take a screenshot in three, two, oh, hey. Welcome plastic free boy. <laughs> Lovely to see somebody plastic free on the call. No worries, I read about not putting it on. Um, cool. So big smiles in three, two, one. Awesome. Let me see that I got it. <laughs> and I'll open the floor if anybody has any questions of it. You're more than welcome to unmute and say hello. I'm just going to quickly um, plug in my laptop. Okay, here we go. All right, I think I have some questions in chat. So I was reading. Um, uh, yeah, so someone said, as you mentioned, aquaculture doesn't have a good track record reputation at the moment. And that is actually dangerously true. Um, uh, well, I think particularly land-based aquaculture has such a bad reputation. Um, and now, you know, we've no, we're learning more and more about the diseases that um, are spreading in these, even the open ocean systems too. And we, um, we really want to provide food to a growing population. Um, but we also want to ensure that they're resistant to disease and they're, they're not under huge immune stress. This is um, very important to us. Um, yeah, what other questions? Isn't the email here? Okay. Any way of separating the exudate off? Yes, there are ways. So we're thinking it only releases these secondary metabolites um, when it's alive. So we're wondering if you're just administering it as an extract, um, 
it will not be continually like those clan cells won't be alive to uh, release those toxic chemicals in the water. So using an extract might be um, a promising method uh, and has been used in for fish aquaculture. So that's also exciting. Ooh. Yeah. Mm. Oh, thank you. Finding the negative in the research is just as valuable as the positive. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful okay well yeah if anyone has any questions or otherwise like you can email me um i can put my email in the chat sure and there's a million thank yous as well in case you didn't see them yeah thank you so much it's been such a pleasure it's been so fun you're gonna smash it your um honors presentation now yeah well i unfortunately will have to make it far more technical <laughs> yeah you yeah. will i'm sure yeah. Ooh, um, there's another question from plastic free boy when will the red seaweed be used in the farming industry when a cow is going to eat the seaweed maddie yes this is a great question so one of the biggest challenges yet to be um, to be found is how do we grow it on a large scale mm -hmm. we have found uh, we're able to grow asparagopsis the red seaweed in land-based systems like when i had um that picture of that big barrel with the bubbling red seaweed so we're able to grow it like very easily in land um, but growing it out in the ocean is really, really challenging um, because we have like, currents and water contamination and all these other environmental factors. Um, is it easier in places in, in lagoons and areas? Like if we just turn Noosa into one giant seaweed farm, would that work? Well, first of all, it has to be local to that. Area. So I don't believe that asparagus is local to Noosa, but I but it is local to Moffat, which is like rough, rocky reef ecosystems. Um, so perhaps we could grow it there. Um, but yeah, when will we when will we use it in the industry? So you'll see it used in the industry in third world countries first. So we're already seeing it potentially in um, Cambodia and they're growing asparagopsis like crazy over there. That is just because um, of different labor costs involved um, and just how they have like a lot of um, community engagement to grow asparagopsis there. And um, yeah, you will see it in third world countries first because they're really desperate to produce food fast, right? So they're just, you know, in, in a short, uh, low demand or well, high demand of food, but, um, you know, obviously their environmental footprint is probably the largest often, not per capita though, like Australia. Yeah, we don't need to go down that way. Mm, no, terrible. Um, I think soon is the answer to that. As soon as possible, we need to start you know, growing it. Yeah. Okay, well, if nobody has... Oh, there's one more question I was about to say. Nobody has. Are they growing it in the ocean or on land in Cambodia? Do they have big tubs or are they putting it in lagoons and stuff? They're growing it in the ocean. Yes, okay. let, me, um, let me try and find a link to it, yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty exciting. Nice. Um, yeah, but um, it is far easier to grow in, in land-based systems than in the ocean. We're going to need some big tubs to get 50,000 tons. Yeah. 
That's a lot. I wonder how many tubs we'll need for New Zealand because there's probably just as many um, sheep compared to cows. I think there's like, there's a lot of sheep. Let me Google how many sheep there are in New Zealand. I think there's 80 million. Very interesting to see if we can apply it over there. Oh. Oops, I didn't mean to send that privately. 26 Damn. million sheep, nice. So I just linked um, a website called Greener Grazing um, and they are on the mission to grow asparagopsis in a large scale. Um, yeah, so that's also very exciting. Yeah. Awesome. Well, if nobody has any more questions and I think we'll let everybody go so they can go cuddle their dog or cat and enjoy the rest of their Tuesday evening. Thank you so much once again, Maddie, um, for presenting. That was an absolutely amazing presentation. Thank you. So glad to be here and thank you for having me. I'll see you all very soon. No worries. And we'll see everybody next month with Dr. Vicky Shaper. <laughs>